team link in whatsapp groups with that group they have joined in the uh, but those students whose mail address are not properly written who have not uh, got any confirmation from us you should check your mail address once again when you are filling the feedback form and attendance form in the afternoon session so if your feedback if your email address are we cannot we cannot send certificate to the email address and that certificate will be left out with our server so be careful when you are filling the uh, feedback form as well as attendance form and particularly the gmail address or email address which you are giving in the form and again Question of five questions. If you answer the five questions, one question is correct among five. You get that. so. This morning session we have two three questions. During afternoon session we have one or two questions, and you can answer the five questions very easily. I hope you will co cooperate with us. In kind of better in time, you have problem. You please, uh, you can ask us. Okay. So now. we have a speaker he is very expert in water resource engineering and he is professor ramakrishna garu uh, about him, the introduction part you can hear so, and i thank professor ramakrishna for accepting our invitation uh, to deliver the webinar lecture on our uh, participants today Thank Ventures uh, uh, College of Engineering and Technology uh, for providing us to conduct such a webinar like this. And I also thank uh, the management of SVCT for uh, giving permission to conduct a webinar like this. Okay. So with the brief, and already I have spoke about the college. Uh, now in the uh, I. Uh, I request uh, uh, to speak few words uh, before we go to introduction of our speaker. Principal sir, may I have attention, sir? Hello, principal. Ah, uh, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, all of you. So I heartily welcome uh, Dr. Ram Krishna Garu, my Guru Garu. So I hope you so you are going to enjoy the session. So thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. Once again, so, thank you, one and all. So to begin the session, before uh, I uh, request our Professor Ramkrishna to take a I request our faculty, Pawan uh, Kumar, Associate Department of Civil Engineering, SVC, to introduce the uh, today's big profile to the parties. Pawan? Sir, I'm audible, sir. Please. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Please continue. I am my, I am myself Pawan Kumar. I am very happy to introduce our resource person, Dr. V. Ram Krishna Garu. He had completed his PhD and M.Tech in Civil Engineering from Bitspilani, B.T.F. from K.L. College of Engineering. Our uh, resource person, our Ram Krishna, Dr. Ram Krishna Garu, worked for three and a half years in Inram Engineering consultancies in Hyderabad, offering our solutions to the industrial clients. Dr. V. Ramakrishna Garu worked for 11 years in Bishpilani as teaching faculty in Civil Engineering Department, besides participating in several administrative roles in the campus. Working for the last 12 years in AP handling teaching and administrative roles and is currently working as professor and head in Civil Engineering Department at Lakhre de Baldetti College of Engineering, Mailavaram. He had overall experience of around 25 years in industry, teaching and research. V. Ramakrishna Garu has published 
around 50 papers in national and international journals and conferences thank you welcome professor ram sir i welcome once again to this webinar sir i proceed to start your session sir sir <coughs> Sir, I am adding to you, sir. No. Hello. Am I adding no? Sir, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, sir, sir. My little bit closer, sir. Why is this? Why is it audible but not louder, sir? Is it audible now? Yes, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, welcome, sir. Once again, please sir, start your presentation. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, and the uh, HOD Secretary General for inviting me to participate in the webinar. And then, with your uh, interest in uh, taking up of this particular webinar, the morning session, I think we must have had a very really nice session, entertaining session, debate session, informative session. Now, we have a small discussion on. Uh, Water quality in modeling. Is it all visible now? The screen is visible, sir. The screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, welcome to all the participants. Good evening to all of you. We will give you a bit of time to motivate you to make a decision. This presentation in the very hot afternoon. Uh, we want to cool you down with some topic on water quality. So this is a water quality morning. This is a general topic and taken here for the benefit of all the young faculty. We are having uh, water everywhere uh, around us. Different sources are there. Then the only thing is whether that particular water is suitable for drinking or not. Everything is very fine, but as far as drinking is concerned, which is to be taken as uh, suitable for drinking, the best part. And the other thing is that when you see in the water, there are a number of parameters are there, physical parameters, chemical parameters are there. So sometimes the water must be treated in a treatment plant. Or sometimes you have to test it at your nearby locations, maybe open wells, bore wells, surface water everywhere. Then we need to understand what is the quality. Once we find out the quality, that may not be sufficient for us to make an understanding from that. So we need to have some sort of a judgment based on the quality parameters. To have some judgment, you go for some modeling. Warning is nothing but a tool to have some prediction based on some parameters. What sort of parameters are there and why we have to do that? This is what we are going to discuss. This is a general the black box type of modeling topic I am discussing today. This can be applied to any domain in civil engineering. It can be geotechnical, it can be structural, it can be human. Yes, the transportation, anything is something we can apply. We can even modify the concept of what we are discussing here. So what we discuss here is necessity of model, types of model, temperature model, water quality indices, regression model, ANN model, mathematical model, and finally we have some, uh, some many conclusions. Now we are talking about modeling. Why we have to have a modeling? Why we should do that? 
as I told you just now, we have a number of sources, water sources. We are tested that a number of parameters, physical parameters, chemical parameters. Then uh, once we have a data, we can't understand anything from that. So we have to have some judgment. To have some judgment, uh, we need to convert into a quantitative information. The values obtained from library testing, they are only qualitative. Some information is there. We can't get anything out of that. We have to convert that into mathematical correlation. To predict whatever we require uh, with the particular object. Otherwise, what also we can do is, uh, suppose there is a treatment plan. The treatment plan, uh, you have a number of unit operations. The unit operations, they are working. And then uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, the final the desired efficiency of the particular treatment plan is to be found out. So what are the inputs to the particular treatment plan, which are affecting the efficiency of the treatment plan? And we identify that, if we try to correlate these two, we try to have some sort of a model. So this is another way we can find out. Another thing is uh, even uh, any other thing, you want to find out the trends. What is happening uh, with regard to one particular variable to uh, respect to another variable. We are doing some tests. For example, uh, we are doing some sedimentation tests in the laboratory as a part of a VTEC project. So there we don't do any modeling. What we do is we will find out the settling efficiency of the sedimentation time in the laboratory with respect to time. So we know two variables there, time and the efficiency of settling. We can identify some trend based on that, there's some sort of model. Otherwise, we can't understand anything from that particular laboratory process. So what we have here now is uh, we're having a real world problem. Some problem is there, some local problem we are taking out. Then converting into a mathematical oriented problem, you make some assumptions. Based on the assumptions, we construct some model, a small model. It can be small model, it can be complicated model with all effects, all the constraints what we have. Then uh, we identify, once we construct that model, we apply that to interpret our solutions. Then we finally get a solution, we work on that. And again, if we have some other problem, we will come back to have another model and do all this. This is a continuous process. So it all depends on where we have to stop. So we should have that cut up in ourselves to close and uh, open that particular loop. So if you see that particular uh, information, I put it in small uh, illustrative diagram. What we have is in the model, we are giving some data as input, we construct a model, we are getting an output. Once we get an output, we can't use directly that. We have to have an error check whether the model there is giving the predictions with regard to the input or not. Once you know the error, we try to rectify that, otherwise we will use the same relation uh, saying that our result is a plus or minus some percentage of accuracy. So this is how we normally develop a small model set for our requirements. Then models generally are classified as physical model and biomedical model. Physical models, they are classified based on relation between the interrelated parameters. Some parameters we take, we try to identify some relation among them and based on that we try to identify. Just now I give an example how to find out the settling efficiency of a settling problem. Then we are finding out settling again with respect to time. That is one sort of a thing. Another example is, uh, suppose in the laboratory you are doing you know, some sort of a filtration test. The filtration test, what you do, you take a small column using any other bottle or any other glass column, then put the filter material on that, pour the water, collect the water from the bottle, and you measure the parameter with respect to time, with respect to depth, with respect to flow rate, whatever is there. So you try to really take a relation between the flow rate and removal efficiency of a particular parameter. Then automatically what will happen? You are going to get something out of that. So what you normally, the general equations are given for overall design of a particular sand filter, the sedimentation tank like that. But the, what is the efficiency of the particular 
operation that may not be available, you can try to identify it through this model so that you can find out which is the best way to control your parameters. So on the physical model, we are having a number of options. Either you can go for an empirical model, you can go for a linear regression model, which we normally do. This is very statistical, of course. And now with the advanced models, we are going for the artificial neural networks. As some of you may go for the GAS model. And once we have all these things, uh, finally, if you have uh, the all the data with you, then we finally go for the mathematical model. What is the difference between the physical model and the mathematical model? Physical model gives you the relation to the amount of the particular parameters. Some temporary arrangement you are going to get. The mathematical model is based on the conservation laws. Conservation laws means conservation of mass, conservation of energy, and conservation of momentum. Based on that, what is the mass flow rate, what is the energy flow rate, what is the momentum flow rate, energy flux, all these things will calculate what is coming into and out of the system. Based on that, we generate a model. So that is what is called a mathematical model. All the other models are basically the physical models. And this is what we normally try. And then finally, we go to the mathematical model. So in this particular uh, presentation, I'll be talking about empirical model, linear regression model, and the AML model. And I take a small example of mathematical model and illustrate. What are the empirical models? And in civil engineering, most of the civil engineering, so then uh, I can give you some examples. In the rainfall estimation models, they are uh, related to only particular domain. Most of them, they are related, focused on particular domain, a small area, confined a small area. Similarly, infiltration model, they are again based on the rainfall and infiltration, which they were percolation with respect to time. So they are all in empirical models. And in absorption, we have a number of isotherms, Langmuir isotherm, Fendi's isotherm, and some other isotherms. They relate the amount of material absorbed on the surface with respect to concentration available in the liquid. So again, we are taking a small trend. So based on some assumptions, so these isotherms are also can be considered as empirical models. An estimation of strong water flow. And in strong water flow estimation also, uh, those who are familiar with water resources engineering, so you know a number of models are available. Some of the models are particularly available for the, the Deccan area, and then some of the areas and models are available, suitable for Jodhpur and Jaipur area, something like that. So they are relevant to only that particular suitability. So this is how we take empirical model. So we can find only that particular domain. Then those who are familiar with wastewater treatment, we are having a, a NRC model, National Research Council model for uh, treatment filter efficiency calculation. So that is again uh, another empirical model. Based on the water of the uh, BOD load coming out of the treatment filter, how much is the volume of the filter, and then how many times uh, the effluent is recycled back as a recirculation factor. Using all these things, they have developed a model called the uh, NRC model. This is by US military, and that's what we call as a National Research Council NRC model. Then we are having water quality indices. What is water quality indices here? This water quality indices, if you see, as I told you in the earlier, we are identifying number of parameters in the laboratory we are determining, but at the same time, we can't get anything out of that except uh, some numbers for the each and every parameters. So now, based on that, we can't have taken any judgment whether that water quality, water water quality is a food or a better. The moderately contaminated or highly contaminated. For that, what we are doing is we are converting uh, those parameters into some index based on certain uh, relationship and assumptions. So once you get that index, then we have some scale. These three, based on that particular scale, we can take a decision that particular water is suitable for drinking or not suitable for something like that. Similarly, if you just go beyond 
can see the different types of model in air pollution uh, engineering aspect. And there are uh, equations for the physical height of the stack. The physical height of the stack, if you are familiar with air pollution technology, it depends on sulfur dioxide emissions as well as particulate emissions. So the height of the stack is uh, taken uh, in terms of the quantity of sulfur dioxide emissions as well as quantity of particulate emissions. So there are totally empirical, you can find out from A into X to the power of B, some, some formula like that. This is a totally empirical equation. And then uh, determination of plume rise. Plume rise again, how much is the height of the plume going above the stack? We are having different models. These models have different assumptions. The moment the plume will be rising based on the stack gas velocity or wind velocity. Two things are there. And the other one is the temperature of the stack gas. The temperature is more, is having high heat content. High heat content is more, the drier is the gas. The drier is the gas, it becomes more lighter. More lighter means it goes above or very high, it goes to very high heights. So there is a lot of heat release. And when the velocity of the stack gas is more compared to the wind velocity, the momentum of stack gas coming out from the stack is very, very high. So that the gas will be going in a very high, way, high height uh, above the exit of the particular plume, exit of the stack. So then again, what the parameter depends upon? It depends upon uh, the diameter of the stack, and then atmospheric pressure, wind, uh, wind velocity, stack gas velocity, and then uh, and what are the other the temperature of the ambient air and temperature of the stack gas, and all those things we take. Uh, Based on that, we are having so many models. Hollis model is there, David and Bryant model is there, Briggs model is there. All these things based on the momentum release conditions. And IS code has given uh, some equations based on the temperature and heat uh, content of the two gases. Then after that, uh, we are having the determination of wind velocity at a particular altitude. So wind velocity is normally measured at a ground level at a height of 10 meters. A 10 meters means the height of a single story building. But normally where you get, want to have the wind velocity, this wind velocity you need to have at uh, the height of the stack around 300 meters uh, or 400 meters away on the ground level. So for that we need to have a extrapolation of is it audible? Audible? Okay, okay. So we need to extrapolate that wind velocity water you measured at the ground level to a different altitude. Some disturbance is coming, yeah. I thought they don't think uh, all the participants have muted their phone, please. All participants should mute their phone for a better decision. Okay, is it all right? No? Can I continue? Okay, so like water quality, you need to have the air quality also. We have to develop the develop index. And uh, traffic noise also, we need to have estimation. And normally, traffic noise depends on number of parameters like traffic flow distance of the vehicle from the center line, where you are measuring the sample, center line of the vehicle movement, and all the other parallel, what are local disturbances and everything. So we can uh, predict the average is sound level, uh, noise level, with respect to traffic uh, flow as well as distance from the source. We can develop an empirical model, some models are already available. And those who are familiar with all the civil engineering terminology, all the models you develop to dimensional, so you are having two different methods. Any of these methods is going to give you an empirical model. Now we try to see the water quality index, how you are going to generate. So what are the available methods? I take one method here and I'm showing you. 
The water quality index, as I told you, this is an empirical model based on certain assumptions and uh, relation among units and uh, parameters. And what you see is we are having a n number of parameters we have measured in the water quality. And depending upon the importance of each of the parameters, we are saying some weights. Random weights we are going to assign. Higher, uh, higher importance is going to get to higher value and lower importance is going to get to lower value. Once we assign that weight, so we take the cumulative value and then take the ratio of each parameter with respect to total weight. That's called the relative weight of each parameter. And then we have a quality index and how you are finding out is the VA minus VI divided by VS minus VA. What is VA is the average value of a particular parameter. VI is the ideal value and the VS minus VA is the bandwidth. Vs is the standard value and Va is the ideal value. According to this model, normally ideal value of the water uh, pH we normally take as a 7. So why 7 again? Uh, below 7 is acidic and above 7 is alkaline. At 7 pH we normally take them. But actually if you go for water quality standards, the permissible value of pH is around 6.5 to 8.5. But when developing this model, we are not going to that particular standard. We are defining a value of 7 is to be taken so that is exactly in the middle of the pH range. And uh, the 0, it should be 0 for all the other parameters. This is the assumption taken which is uh, used in the development of this model. Once you have these values for each parameter, you multiply this WI with the CI, take the weight, take the value and then add all these things to summation. Once we have the summation, we take the values here. Based on the values, we have a judgment of rating. So less than 50, the accumulation is coming. is an excellent quality. And greater than 300 is a totally unsuitable for drinking purpose. So we are giving a normal nomenclature, WP1 PVB. PVB stands for parameter value based model. Now you see here an example. Uh, all these examples are taken from uh, some of the studies which have taken up uh, uh, during my short period. And then here uh, we are taking some uh, 10 uh, sampling uh, locations and we have tested for a number of parameters. I am showing all the values here. And using these values, now we are going to uh, apply this to a uh, water quality index. And then the last column shows the limits uh, as per IS 10,500 and 2012, which is a standard for drinking water quality. Please, sir, you know, we are giving some weight, sir. So this is based on judgment and literature review. I have fixed all these weights, sir. I have fixed all these weights, and then you can see in the fourth column, all the weights are assigned to have a cumulative value of 23. So now relative weight are calculated, 4 by 23, 0.17, something like that. And then standard values are taken from the drinking water quality standards. And then based on that, I calculated the quality index of CI. And then I calculated the product of CIWI in the last column. And based on that, I have taken the total summation. And you can see there somewhere we are having a negative value. It indicates that uh, the actual value is higher than the standard. As I told you, pH value, the upper limit you can go up to 8.5, but standard is only up to 7. So 7 minus something will give you negative value that is reflecting in the negative value of CA. The other model, what we have is uh, the standard value based model. The standard value based model, the end uh, information is also saying the product of a weight factor multiplied by value based factor. So here uh, CI is the same, the water we have calculated earlier, the same methodology we are applying, but the WI value is slightly changed. What is this we are doing here is, uh, we are taking the VSI, VSI is the standard value of the ideal concentration of the height parameter we are taking here, and then one by of that we take, and take summation of that, that means we are multiplying it, uh, equalizing to a value of 1 unity 
and then that value we are using to calculate the weight factor. So once we have these factors here, then again we are going for a rating scale, and based on that, less than 50 is excellent, and greater than 100 is highly contaminated. So you can remember uh, the upper limits of rating scales. You remember there. The earlier we had more than 300 as the contaminated water. Now here we are having greater than 100 is highly contaminated. So because of this model, uh, the assumptions of the model, the rating scale levels have been uh, defined and been changed. So now if you see a sample calculation for the same data, so now I am having there uh, all the parameters here, standard values are given, and then. Uh, Now one by VSA, one by inverse of the standard value I've taken in the fourth column, and then I made a cumulative value and take inverse of that is coming out to be 2.53, and using the K value I calculate the WI value as per the formula, and then make it the total sum will be WI will be equal to one, that is equal to 100 percent of that, and the quality index as defined earlier. We are calculated based on the bandwidth of each of the parameters, and once we have this, we have multiplied these two to get the WSA value. So now, what you see here, and for the information's sake, I try to compare both these models to see how much is the difference coming out here for all the ten sampling locations. The blue color shows the parameter value-based model. The first one, where what we discussed earlier, and the second one, red color indicates the standard value based model. That is second one what we discussed here. And now what you see there is the second values. Most of the locations, the second value is slightly lesser than that of the first value. So now what else? Now this may not give you any clear picture. The numbers may be misleading. But where exactly the problems can come and what is the problem? That we have to try to analyze that. So I made it uh, with respect to values converted into rating. Now what you see is uh, the parameter value based model. We have most of the locations we are having poor value, and only a uh, couple of occasions we are having a good uh, quality of the water. But based on the first model, the second model, if you see. Here also, moderately contaminated is mostly there, and highly contaminated is there. So, majorly, these two things are coming. So, and nothing is there for drinking the uh, suitability for drinking of the water. So, none of the locations are clearly suitable for drinking. So, one thing you can understand from the sampling location number five, though the first model gives a good quality. A second model is giving highly contaminated, and then the first model is giving the poor for the sample number one, and then is giving the moderately contaminated in second model. So now that is to be understood that why exactly these differences of ratings have come for the same set of values. For that, we try to made a small comparison. So what is coming out here? Which parameters are identified here for causing the more amount of problems here? High values of turbidity is there in more the cases, but uh, TDS, uh, total hardness, sulfate, and magnesium, they are giving uh, the uh, difference in the first model. Similarly, in other models, other problems are also identified here. So what we see, the first model is having some extra parameters. The second model we are having the other parameters, but second model what you are seeing is uh, we are taken based on uh, the standard value, and first model uh, what we are taken is only based on some judgment of some allocation of weightage, weightages. So now once we understand this, for eliminating common parameters, then what happened to the excess of the parameters for the same location? Then when we try to compare these two, what happened is the excess of these parameters got adjusted when you converted them into the standard value conversions. That's how the impact of those parameters got eliminated. The second thing is uh, 
when you have the person model, parameter value based model, the main assumption what you are taking there is the weightage. The weightage what you are giving there, some numbers they are giving. The numbers can be varying. That is called a Delphi technique. That can be varying for person to person. Perception may be changing. The perception changes automatically, the value will change. So, uh, but the second model is trying to take uh, the inverse of the standard of particular parameter. So, this can give you definitely a better assumption compared to the effectiveness of the model. So, when you see these two models, so the results of the second model based on standard value that can be considered uh, more effective rather than the first model. So, based on this, uh, now what you see is uh, what you see is uh, w, the majority of the waters are uh, not suitable for drinking. So, at least one or two parameters are above the permissible standards. That is the reason why the values are not suitable for them, that the samples are not suitable for drinking. So, finally what we have concluded, whatever may be the source of water in these uh, locations, the water is not at all suitable for drinking because of presence of excess of some parameter. For example, you take here uh, point number, location number 7, the first model gives you a rating of good, but second model gives you high values of pH. So, though the high values of pH is there, the rating of the first model is giving you good. It is not possible. It is not possible. Logically not possible. So, that's why the first model can be ignored. And the second is now if you take another example, item number, location number 9, it is also giving you good uh, result, a good rating. But whereas if you see in the second model, that uh, the problem is with the high values of pH and turbidity. And pH and turbidity are higher, how can we rate that particular water as a good quality? So that is also good. But because of the problem taking the assumptions, the first model is not so reliable. Though it is used by many researchers and is published in a number of journals, this type of model. But uh, the drawback of this model is assigning the weights. That is the only drawback here. So based on the, uh, out of these two, the second model, based on the standard value of the parameter, seems to be more appropriate for uh, making a, a rating and the calculation of index. The other one we normally do is a regression. Everybody knows that. So when you talk about uh, even newspaper sales for each month, we talk about uh, sales and uh, paper uh, the amount received. We talk about regression. Some some sort of prediction we are going to trending. We go for trending. So this is called a regression of two parameters. There will be a dependent parameter and there will be a dependent parameter. We are having only one dependent parameter, one independent parameter. We can convert this into a simple linear regression. And there will be nonlinear regression also. Y is equal to AX to the power of B and AB to the power of X, something like that. So those things can be converted uh, into linear form. And that also can be converted into linear form and then we can come out with uh, some sort of modeling in the uh, regression. But the only thing is only one uh, Dependent variable and another independent variable. That's all. But sometimes in engineering, uh, we need to have more number of input parameters which are affecting a particular uh, output. There. So then uh, this type of simple linear regression may not be sufficient and suitable. So we have to go for multiple regression, which is normal in the case in our majority of engineering applications. So when you go for multiple regression, we have to form the y is equal to a naught plus a one x one plus a two x two plus a three x three and all. So a a naught a one a two are the regression coefficients, and x one x two x three are the variables. So they're independent, and then y is the output that's an independent parameter. So we can regress the data into this particular form, and then we can uh, convert this into empirical model. So what you have done is we have taken a water quality sample here 
and then we tested some water samples and then we try to understand the relations uh, among these variables. So in this model, what we have tried is uh, we follow three steps here and the model development step one and then when you are using specific data set and uh, then you have to have a calibrate, once you have to develop a model, formulation a particular relationship, then that should be converted into a model and the model should be calibrated before it is used uh, in a generic form. So what are the database is there that we divide into two parts and 75 to 80 percent we use for development of the model and the remaining 20 to 25 percent uh, we are using for testing. And then we have to go for error checking, we can use it for the standard deviation for, for the estimation of the error and you can see the formula with respect to actual value and predicted value, we are going to use that. So what we have done, we have taken 25 samples here and then we try to develop uh, two relationships. So these relationships are based on the fundamental relation among the, these two parameters. The TDS, the total dissolved solids, is a function of many interrelated parameters, but I am assuming that is a function of only chlorides. And TDS is a function of only electric conductivity. TDS is a function of total, only total hardness. These three assumptions are taken, one assumption I have taken. Or estimation linear, simple linear regression. But normally, if you see, the TDS is a function of calcium, magnesium, chloride, sulfates, and as well as alkalinity. Why alkalinity? The alkalinity gives the uh, concentration of carbonates and bicarbonates. All these things are a part of TDS. Similarly, total hardness. Hardness is again uh, calcium, magnesium related uh, chlorides, sulfates, and uh, carbonates. The total alkalinity is again a part of the carbonate and bicarbonate. So all these things put together in another relationship. So the relations have been developed uh, based on the intricate relation among those particular parameters. Once we have all the values, based upon these values, converted this into the respective models. Now you can see here two models and linear models are tested in the form of y is equal to a plus bx and y is equal to ax in total b. y is equal to a plus bx is simple linear form and y is equal to ax in total b is a non-linear form converted back into a linear form. And then we normally we take uh, the r square value as the judgment uh, uh, with regard to the accuracy of that model. If r square value is close to 1, that is more accurate. So now what you see, the three relationships to what we have discussed earlier, so they are not giving uh, comfortable values of R square. So it's showing around 80% error in the first column and second column also approximately 80% error. So they are not a good fit with regard to the models water we are considered. So it shows that the TDS is a function of some other parameters which is not considered in the particular relationship. Those things we have to identify now. So to identify that, we are taking second relationship here. And according to this, if you see, the total hardness is a function of x and x, x y, z, so and so. And third, second one is the TDS is a function of so and so, so and so. Then we are under the other model. We are taking standard deviation. And then finally, what you see here, the standard deviation for the first uh, model, we are having 4.45 and R square is equal to 0 0.99. And for second one, the standard deviation is at 25.8, but R square is at 0.92. So what does it mean? Though these two models are very close to each other as far as uh, uh, compliance is concerned, that means what are the parameters we are considered to determine the output? Uh, they are more or less related to that particular output parameter. That's the first point we understood. Second point what we understood is uh, the, the values, whatever we got there, they are close fitting to each other, second point. But the third point, what you understand here, the deviation among these values is again another important factor. So not only the R square, it shows that the standard deviation is lower only for the first relation. The second relation, though the R square value is 92%, the standard deviation is slightly higher. That means 
that model, whatever we have developed here, that may not give you the accurate resolution. So, out of these two relations, what we have developed, only the first relation can give you a better accurate results for our experimental database. This is how we are going to conclude based on the results we got. The other one, what we normally do is on the ANN model. The normally we try to the regression model, but the regression model problem is uh, it will not under understand the sudden jump in the variation of the database. So it will not take the uh, jumps there. It will not take nonlinear form of data variation. So the uh, neural network model can go along with that variations because they are like mimicking your neural present in the human brain. So we tell uh, our brain that when you write only this particular way, we recognize this as number one. If you write like this only, we can say it is equal to two. We are continuously giving input to the brain that uh, as, as long as you don't write this in this particular form, we cannot consider that uh, as the particular uh, output. So that's why it takes uh, more uh, care in understanding all the variations in the given database. So what we have is we are having a number of inputs we can have and we can have hidden layers, input layer is there, hidden layer is there, output layer is there. And what you see is that the number of inputs are connected to hidden layer and hidden layers are connected to output layer. These are connected with some activation function. Activation function is nothing but it is taking the transformation of the values from input to hidden and hidden to output layer. The advantage of this ANN model is here we can have more than one output, whereas the multiple integration we have only one output. So that's the advantage we have. And second advantage what we have is generally ANN model will try to understand the nonlinearity of the database and try to make a close fit with the exact values, though there is a slight slump here and there. So what you see the, when you try to run this type of model, the normally the number of operating parameters is uh, how many number of input uh, nodes are there? That is one thing is there. How many number of output nodes are there? The second thing. And how many hidden layers? The number of hidden layers again we can have one, two, three, four like that. It all depends on the complexity of the equation. And then uh, the other thing is and how many times the loop has to repeat from input to hidden, hidden to output and then back to input like this. This is what we call as epoch. So these epochs are uh, nothing but uh, the number of iterations. This has to tell. As I told you earlier, so if number two is like this, then our brain should understand number two. In our childhood, we used to write and slay to the chart. Now repeatedly writing, repeatedly writing, repeated writing. After writing 10 times or 20 times, we will understand how to write number two. So the number of iterations we are giving this network model is what we call as epochs. So number of neurons in hidden layer. So depends again on the complexity. It again trial and error basis. Number of hidden layers are also trial and error basis. A more and more complex data is there, the more and more internal hidden layers we have to take in. Otherwise we have to go for increase the number of hidden number of neurons in the hidden layer. And then another one is uh, the error tolerance. To so how much extent you can give the error? So it's one percent, point one percent, less than point one percent, something like that. So till that particular point is concerned, the cycle is going to get repeated, 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 repeated. Till you get that particular error, or the number of epochs are closer to that. Whichever comes first, the loops will, will start there. Then we are having learning rate. That is nothing but the acceleration. The acceleration we are going to give it to that. Uh, different learning rates are there to start the model and ignite that. So these are the operating parameters normally do. And uh, like earlier what we did in the regression model, here also we checked the database and some portion, 75 to 80 percent we go for the training the model and remaining 20 to 25 percent we go for testing the model. And when you are testing the model, we have to use the error check. Uh, what error thinking we are going to apply the same formula using the standard deviation method. So now again, uh, another problem we have taken. 
uh, based on the water quality. This study was taken up some time from way back uh, before uh, 2008 and published in 2008. So now uh, only four parameters are taken, tar chloride, hardness, calcium chloride. And then uh, we have data. And then you can see there the number of operating parameters also we have taken. Number of neurons in the hidden nail, epochs, error tolerance, and the learning rate. So once we have this data, we put feed in this information. Around 25 data points were taken initially. So the first iteration were taken at that time. So 20 points were used for uh, the testing and try, uh, developing, and uh, five data points were taken for testing the model, training and testing. And more data points, uh, more and more data points we have. And the more and more accurate you are going to have. The lesser data points you have, the more and more bias you are going to get in from the form of the error in the result. So now what we do is when you, we are taking, altering all these parameters to find out what is the optimal combination to get the, the lowest value of standard deviation. So now what you see here at the bottom what you have written, the number of neurons needed there, six. Uh, 10,000 epochs, error tolerance of 0 0.01 and the learning rate of 0 0.5, we are obtaining a standard deviation of 0 0.00054. So, this is the least value we obtained when we are changing the number of neurons in the hidden layer as the nitrated process. Uh, we are trying the network through that and finally what we got is an optimum range of parameters. Once you obtain the optimal range of parameters for the testing and training of the model, use that model for testing your data. Once you test this data, what you take in the take relation is the total hardness is a function of calcium chloride and chloride. This is what you are taking. So now what you see there in the two graphs, there as I try to compare the multiple regression model with the ANN model, just to understand which is going to be more effective in terms of the same data. And what you see here is the ANN model is going to give you almost a similar data with very, very slow, low value of standard deviation compared to the regression model. A regression model, you see there is a slight uh, spikes here and there. So, what is, that's what you understand is, as I told you earlier, the regression models may not understand sudden peaks and jumps in the database, color non-linearity in the database. But whereas regression the neural network model will uh, try to catch that particular irregularities because they are being trained continuously over a number of iterations. So that is the advantage of the ANN model. So this is what we obtain. And after this particular application, this uh, ANN was uh, used uh, uh, successfully for a number of applications. For example, another application I tell you is not only this application. Suppose that you are having a water treatment plant or a senior treatment plant. So there you are having a number of operating parameters. Ultimately, what you require at the end, you may be required to devote the mode efficiency or suspend solids in efficiency. Those two are your output variables. What are the input variables? You take the input variables. And then uh, we are having large amount of data based on monthly data, seasonal data, yearly data, more and more data points you have and more and more uh, accurate will be the model. You can use that model, put it in neural network and then find out how to monitor and how to uh, control the, uh, the model, the performance efficiency of that particular treatment plan. A number of cases have been published and then they are available in the So the idea here is to uh, just explain you there are various ways to put your data and then try to project it to solve your problems for a better understanding and for a better application. Then we will come to the last part. This is the mathematical model. As I told you here, mathematical model is based on the conservation laws. In the conservation laws, conservation of uh, mass, conservation of uh, energy, conservation of momentum, all these things. A number of examples are there in our uh, environmental engineering, particularly to water, uh, water uh, domain, water resources domain, and the environmental domain. And in activated sludge process, everybody knows 
and then they are having adsorption modeling for batch studies and column studies. Groundwater flow through porous media, and there you are having some water is going through porous media between the pores is going. So it will undergo a process of advection, diffusion, and dispersion. All these things put uh, converted into some model equation. Then that can be solved uh, for the, the groundwater flow predictions. And Streeter Fels model. Streeter Fels model everybody knows as a, a dissolved oxygen model. The dissolved oxygen model, what you are doing there, you are trying to understand how the DO is getting reduced. So this is a natural process, a dynamic process. As the river uh, gets the wastewater into it, uh, and then the DO gets reduced. As the river continuously starts flowing, the DO starts increasing or decreasing, depending on the reaeration uh, or deoxygenation. So it's a dynamic process, and then some oxygen will come in into the uh, river, some oxygen will go back into the air. All this continues, this is a mass transfer process. So the street and fence model is again a mathematical model based on the mass transfer and the, the uh, mass transfer and dynamic situation. A lot of simulation models are developed using Streeter Fels model when the number of inputs are entering into the river at different points of the time and how the stream water quality is going to change, where you are going to get the DO minimum and DO maximum, and at what distance you are going to have the recovery of the quality of the water in terms of DO. All these things we can do through Streeter Fels model. So there are limitations are there, and there are some uh, additions are also there. The Streeter Fels model does not take into eutrophication, algal photosynthesis in Kerkhorn. Some correction factors have been made, and then uh, they are also available. But in general, what we normally study at the BTEC level in normal all the textbooks, the Streeter Fels model or DEVO model, the simple model applicable for a river water having only one in the input source of wastewater. So this is again a mathematical model. And then Gaussian dispersion model, everybody knows in the air pollution problems. The wastewater gas is coming out of the chimney, will go into the air in three dimensions, x, y, and z. So there again they follow dilution and dispersion. So based on that, in y direction, z direction, they will undergo dispersion. So we have that uh, parameters. And then we are using Gaussian dispersion model for the dilution dispersion under specific conditions. Those who are familiar with uh, these models and doing some calculations, they definitely they have a clear idea. So now for illustration, I have shown here the activated sludge process. And why I am telling you this is based on the conservation of loss. So here you see the aeration tank and the secondary clarifier. Together we are taking as a single unit, and that's what we call a system. System boundary is there, and the system boundary, how much BOD is entering into this boundary, how much is going out as a plane, how much is coming out in the form of a sludge. This is what is required for us. Based on this, we are going to calculate the efficiency of the system and the amount of uh, recycling and all those things we are going to calculate. So that's how this activated sludge process is the uh, best example of a mathematical model. So now another thing I am trying to tell you here is uh, this mathematical model which we normally come across is the absorption and desorption cycles. They are mainly based upon the mass transfer. What is the meaning of mass transfer, absorption and desorption? I'll try to put it in a small uh, example here. Suppose uh, we are uh, having a capacity of taking uh, four rupees. That is our saturation limit. The maximum take only four rupees. Suppose you have taken only two rupees. So you still have a capacity to take two more rupees. So what you do, you take two more rupees. That is, you are absorbing uh, two more rupees into your digestive system. That is called absorption. That's what you say is CS. CS is nothing but saturation concentration. Saturation concentration is greater than what actually you are having, then you are having absorption. Then uh, suppose you are having only 4 rupees in saturation capacity, due to some reason you are taking the 2 more extra, when 4, 6 EP you are taking, somewhere you have to reduce the extra 2. That means you are releasing those 2 EPs out. That is what you are calling a desorption. This is a natural phenomenon occurring uh, 
in the purification of water systems. The only problem is here, if we are talking about the, the oxygen uh, getting a dissolved from the gases phase into liquid phase. The fundamental problem here is the, the oxygen is uh, getting, the, while you're asking the oxygen to get transferred from the gases phase into liquid phase. These two are different phases. You can't uh, come in directly and get dissolved into the liquid. So this is the interfacial uh, gas uh, transfer, interfacial transfer of our material here. So what will happen, the gas will come there at the liquid level, but will not uh, go into the liquid level because it's having some uh, friction at the surface of or interface of the liquid before get entering into the liquid, right? So now other thing is uh, this is a, a problem with regard to adsorption. I mean the desorption case is there, the oxygen will go up to the liquid level but will not go into the ga our gases, uh, the, uh, the atmosphere because some other problem is there, some uh, friction will be stopping the oxygen to get out into the air from the water. We want to break that particular friction layer. The friction layer you want to break, what you do, you try to make a mix of it. So another example I try to give here for a better understanding. So the normally you, these, these things we have to discuss at the, the classroom level. So now you go to a tea, a tea shop uh, to have a cup of tea. And then what you'll do, you'll take a cup of milk here, add some uh, tea solution, and put some sugar. And then uh, when you're asking their sugar to get dissolved in tea, it will not dissolve. Definitely not dissolve. Why? Because the sugar is in the crystal form, solid form. You're asking the sugar to get dissolved in the liquid form. It is not possible. So what you have there, some break, some uh, gap is there. Again, the interfacial problem. Solid phase to liquid phase, transfer problem. For that purpose, what you are doing? You are using a spoon and you are stirring it. Or you are now you take another glass and then make it up and down and then make it the dissolve. So you are using some alternative devices to break that barrier for getting transferred from one phase to another phase. The same thing we are doing here. The, this is uh, the normal process what you are having in the D1 model. The where our deoxygenation, deoxygenation continuously take place. When you're having the rapid mixing is there, turbulent flows are there, you're having more reoxygenation. The laminar flows are there, the interfacial mixing will not be there, then uh, the reoxygenation will be less. So, this is called the two film diffusion theory. Because there are two films are there, one above and one below. This is basically called two film diffusion theory. And what you see is the driving force. What is the driving force? Higher concentration to lower concentration is the driving force. Mass is getting transferred from higher to higher concentration to lower concentration. Heat is going from higher temperature to lower temperature. Energy is going from higher energy to lower energy. Pressure is uh, liquid going from higher pressure to lower pressure. Elevation, higher elevation to lower elevation. These are all the driving forces. The driving forces are coming from conservation law. That's why we are calling this as a mathematical model. So now I'm taking a simple example before winding up. So this is adsorption, everybody knows. Adsorption and adsorption both are different. Adsorption means completely dissolved. Adsorption means uh, it is uh, getting attached onto the surface. This is normally we see in our in houses also, where you are having water filters, you are putting a granular activated carbon filter for treating your water. So all the dust particles, a lot of the pollutants are there, contaminants, they get attached onto the surface of the particular particle. And uh, that would normally be understand, but normally what will happen, what are the particles are there, they are not uh, completely solid and homogeneous. There are, there are large amount of inner pores are there. These particles are developed like that. You can see in the picture. The picture may not be clear to you, but what you can see, the pores you can see. These pores will provide large amount of surface area. The, the water the contaminants are there, from the liquid, they will get transferred into the inner surfaces of the pores and they can then sitting there. So, there has a, what will happen when immediately they will go into, deeper into the pores and then uh, small concentrations are there and remaining particles they are going to sit on the outside of the surface. 
So outside surface you are having the maximum concentration and inner surface you are having the lower concentration. That means in terms of mathematics what you try to say is uh, when R is equal to 0 the concentration is minimum. When R is equal to full uh, the, that is nothing but outer surface the concentration is going to max. This is how we try to understand a physical phenomena in the mathematical formulation. So this again here also again the, the, what we discussed earlier the driving force higher concentration and lower concentration again the same thing will come here. So one, the, one two points are there one is the liquid to solid and another one is within the solid. Two ways the pollutants are getting removed. Something is coming from liquid to higher concentration, lower concentration on the adsorbent surface, the particle surface. This is where mass transfer is going to take place. And within the surfaces of the particle, inside the particle, where dispersion is going to take place. So using these two, so the models have been developed. One of the models is a homogeneous surface diffusion model. And another thing also, as you observe from the figure, when you are doing a batch study, they are not a call-up study. Batch studies means you take a small beaker and then you take contaminated water, you put some amount of activated carbon in there, you stir it. Why you are stirring it? Again, I told you earlier, to increase the, decrease the friction layer and increase the mass transfer. So that's why you are rotating all the things, mixing all the things. So now, based on this, uh, we are having a mathematical formula is called as a homogeneous surface diffusion model for the batch studies and dou Q by dou T is equal to capital D into so and so. Here capital D is nothing but dispersion and the Q is the concentration and T is with respect to time and R is the radius. Based on this model, so what we can do is we can discretize this model and the reduce into differential uh, partial differential equation to linear differential equation linear differential equation can be converted into a numerical model and numerical model can be converted into a simulation model and once you get the model what you will do is uh, we will try to uh, develop a code for that and then we generate that and you try to uh, find out the values. So when you are doing a model then what you do is uh, we will try to compare that with some standard data. I hope the uh, picture uh, is uh, visible to all of you. Uh, we are taking it from the book, we are not available again. So that's why a slide you can understand that. So you can see that uh, the two values are very close to each other with respect to the parameters what we have tested. That means what our simulation model, what we developed by us uh, is close to the published data. That means uh, the model is accurate. You know, we have come to the conclusion that our model is like accepting, we having an accepted value of some other researcher who have followed the same model. So with this information, we are model verified and then we are using that for different combinations. And in the different combinations, what we are doing is uh, we are changing the value of uh, KF. KF stands for mass transfer coefficient as well as D. D stands for diffusion. So from these pictures what you see, the higher is the KF value, the higher is the pollutant removal efficiency. Pollutant removal efficiency is given in terms of fraction on the y-axis and the x-axis you are having contact time and it is tested for a number of parameters. So now what you see there, you see the graph, from the graph what you see for the higher amount of mass transfer coefficient you are seeing that higher amount of uh, pollutant removal efficiency is there. And in the bottom picture also you see the same thing. Here. The higher is the coefficient of the mass transfer coefficient and higher values are there and the bottom values are showing here relatively slower, lower values of K. What it shows from these two figures is uh, the mass transfer coefficient is going to be more dominant. That is uh, taking the concentration out from the liquid and the getting out of the surface of the solid, that is more important rather than pulling the contaminant from the outer surface to the inner surface. So that is not uh, a significant parameter from these two. This is what we can understand from this. The difference between the higher upper one and the bottom one is the concentration of uh, liquid and the adsorbent, the solid, what you applied. So that is the only difference between these two. In either of these two, what you see 
the trends are more or less similar. So our analysis is pakka now. So now, after doing this mathematical model, sometimes what we'll do is uh, we can have a parametric series also. When we are defined in, in, in the, the discretizing this model and coming out with some conclusion, which of the parameters are more important, which of the things are not important. Uh, to understand these two, we can go for uh, a parametric study and this uh, you can also do some parametric study and then you can find out. And here also you can uh, take uh, understand the same thing here by changing the values and keeping some other values are fixed there. You can understand the upper lines are mainly uh, related to the mass transfer coefficient. The higher values are mass transfer coefficient, they are related to higher efficiency. And one more thing is upper one and lower one, the water difference is a very small concentration of solid is going to give you more efficiency and the small concentration of liquid is going to give you more efficiency than higher concentration of liquid. So that is how we understand the parametric study and the fixes from the models for your study here. So, now, this is all about I try to uh, explain here. What you understand from all these things is now you can understand. Uh, I will try to give you only a black box uh, information. This type of information can be after, uh, applied to any of the domains as you need. It can be geotech, it can be transportation, it can be concrete technology, it can be any other subject. Uh, first, we try some empirical model, then we try to go for some regression model. Then if you possible, you can go for an ANN model and if there is any possibility, we can go for even a mathematical model. So, these things will be available based on your own subject domain. Number of models are available. The only thing is you have to identify which of them is more comfortable for you. That is the only thing you have to understand. Then you can have a better models also, a better visualization also, a better analysis also, a better prediction also. So, a model will help in predicting the trends and efficiency of a process of an activity over a period of time. There are several approaches, I will show only small models. I did not talk about the other models. And one more thing is, uh, as I told you earlier, the wastewater treatment process and water treatment process, the number of unit operations are there. If I want to have an optimum design of the number of parameters, the number of processes, we can have an optimizing model. That uh, things we did not discuss. That is uh, the uh, opportunity to study those things also in the optimum model of the treatment plant efficiency. Then uh, the model should be calibrated before developing, uh, developing before the scope of use. This is what we have seen earlier. The testing is done, and the training of the data, and then testing of the data, then error is also checked. Then once it is done, then finally you are going to use that. Uh, Using a particular model, it depends only on your own requirement and constraint. Everybody is very happy, every subject is having some constraint. Each and every uh, experiment also having constraints. Your model is also having constraint. Your laboratory constraint, manpower constraint, everything is there. So it's not that everybody jump into a model and all. So some simple models also will give you the information. The graphical model also will give you information for what can be the output from this. More than the model population, analysis of these results are more important. So, as I told you here, try to understand more. Because when you are trying to do some model, then we should also know what is your expect from that model. The end of the model, what you are going to expect from that. If you know that, then it will be better for us to get more uh, effectiveness from the model analysis. The negative aspects identified in the results may lead to further studies. So it's not that every model uh, you will try will give you a positive result. Sometimes it may give negative results also. In having negative results, you try to correct your model, you try to correct your process, you try to correct your uh, laboratory results, you try to identify the correct parameters, then you come back and then you try to do another model so that uh, you will get a successful result. So, what I suggest to you is you keep going on, there is no need of stopping, it is only just beginning and I hope that uh, all the young faculty who are uh, assembled here, who are receiving here, so they will get benefited to some extent by the small ideas I am shared here. And I thank the 
హెచ్ఓడి ఎస్ఈడి దీని డిపార్ట్మెంట్ చక్రవర్తి గారు ఈజ్ ఎ క్లోజ్ ఫ్రెండ్ ఆఫ్ మై అండ్ ప్రిన్సిపాల్ డాక్టర్ సురేంద్ర గారు ఈజ్ ఆల్సో మై ఎక్స్ కోలి ఎట్ ద మదర్ లొకేషన్ ఆఫ్ ది కాలేజ్ అండ్ ఫర్ గివింగ్ అండ్ మేనేజ్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ ఎస్పీసీ ఫర్ గివింగ్ ది ఆపర్చునిటీ అండ్ లిజింగ్ టు మై వర్డ్స్ పేషెంట్లీ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ వాయిస్ <laughs> 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 Thank you, sir, for an excellent presentation. Uh, even I could uh, learn a few points from your lecture, sir. Uh, thank you for your valuable time, for good time. And uh, excellent presentation, sir. And the uh, quality of water is one parameter, and uh, how to model that quality is also another, another aspect. And uh, which model suits best to that is also another thing. And uh, you have covered all the points related to modeling. And thank you very much, sir. And uh, I hope all the participants uh, have received that message information. And uh, you please uh, try to adopt these techniques in your project works and uh, <coughs> any research works. So I thank Ramakrishna Guru for his valuable time and presentation. So any questions from participants, uh, please uh, unmute your mic and ask. <coughs> participants any students uh, who are uh, pursuing the environmental engineering in water quality i think they can ask anyone is coming forward once again i will take questions from faculty ha uh, hello hello sir good evening sir i think we have to have an ice breaking session sir somebody should ask a question first then slowly we start asking <laughs> sir good evening sir 